Thank you, Chair. And again, let me add my um, thanks to Chair Moores. Seems like a long time ago. It's been a kind of emotional morning, but I want to thank our UH West Oahu hosts for the beautiful, beautiful welcoming Oli from the campus community. Um, and the testifiers for um, their testimony for our newest renaming. Um, it, yeah, it's was, it was a good morning. Um, so let me update on a few things noted in the agenda. Um, first, I want to um, let you know that the new attainment goal uh, for the state of Hawaii has been adopted by the um, Hawaii P20 Council. Uh, you were briefed on this. Uh, apologies to our two new, newest regions. You were not briefed on this, but this was uh, last year in July, and this is the new attainment goal. Uh, Hawaii's graduates for Hawaii's future to replace the 55 by 25. And at that time, um, we talked you through why we were moving from a simple metric uh, to something uh, more complex. Uh, this was approved by the P20 Council in December. Regent Haining is your uh, representative to the P20 Council, uh, which is focused on uh, the whole education pipeline from uh, pre-K uh, onto our transitions into the workforce. There was strong support, most of the discussion, and I think we'll be seeing this playing out over the next months, is around what words we use to talk about pre-K programming uh, to, uh, do we call it early education, early learning, pre-K, uh, and then it wraps up into a whole bunch of um, legal and even potentially constitutional questions around public and private uh, provision of those services. But other than that, there was a lot of enthusiasm uh, because we talked a lot as a, um, you talked a lot about vision and we came back with a new vision and mission for the university uh, as part of the new strategic plan. I just wanted to share today uh, as a reminder, uh, the vision for this new attainment goal and then the four goals themselves. So the vision is we envision a Hawaii where plentiful local jobs that pay a family sustaining wage are filled by talented local residents eager to make a difference right here at home. A Hawaii where all residents are equipped to contribute to kind and thriving communities, regardless of their backgrounds and locations. So pretty straightforward. And for that, we had the four priorities, very similar uh, to what we shared with you in the middle of last year. Universal access to high quality early learning opportunities, universal preparation of every K-12 student throughout their education for college, career, and citizenship, universal access to post-secondary opportunity and success, and for universal education and training of Hawaii residents to fill and create living wage jobs across the state. So it's very consistent with our new strategic plan. Uh, the Board of Education is developing a new strategic plan. We expect it early this spring. Um, and um, I think we have stars in alignment for many things that we want to do together, including the legislative priorities that you probably um, have read about uh, over the and administration priorities uh, for this coming session with that particular focus on early education, an area where uh, Hawaii lags uh, most of the country. Um, so this is now being socialized. Um, you recall we have a team that included UH, DOE, Governor's Executive Office on Early Learning, Hawaii Community Foundation, Maui Economic Development Board. We're our core team and we're socializing this now. We met with the governor, with legislators, uh, Hawaii Business Roundtable, and we're producing glossy collateral as is our way online and a little bit of paper. And we'll share that with you when it is um, completed. Um, a few comments about enrollment. Uh, I apologize. These are yesterday's numbers, not this morning's numbers. We update everything at 7 a.m. and I was getting ready to drive out here. So, um, but I, I don't think things change that much at this point. Um, so headcount enrollment, our imperfect measure uh, is down about 0.4%. Um, this is actually an improvement over our fall declines. Uh, we were down 2.8%. So it's a good sign. 
still a decline, uh, but it's a smaller decline and smaller declines precede increases. So we're happy about that. Uh, UH Manoa, Hawaii CC, Honolulu CC, and Windward CC are all modestly up spring over spring. These are numbers like 50 to 100 students, so they're not huge. Um, and none of our campuses were up fall over fall. So again, it's it's a sign that things are getting better. Um, and those four campuses plus Kauai Community College are up on student semester hours. That's the amount of teaching actually taking place uh, so far this spring. Um, as a system, we have an increase in students taking courses at multiple campuses. And um, this is a great example of our continuous improvement. This is an area of Vice President Halbert has been working with um, a number of our leaders to really improve our ability to enable students to um, enroll in multiple campuses uh, at the same time. Um, it does contribute to the duplication of headcounts, so it cuts both ways in that regard, but it's definitely good for our students. Um, and it's um, enabled also by the increase in online learning. I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. Early college enrollments are up over 15% spring over spring. Um, we hope that will bode well for helping address the DOE college going rate issues that I've highlighted in the past. And early college numbers are up for nine of our 10 campuses spring over spring, which is great. Uh, the one campus that's down is down by three students, so not actually much to be alarmed about. Everything that I just shared, by the way, that's is all data that you can get at data.hawaii.edu if you were in the mood to prowl web pages and um, uh, the interfaces are pretty cool. You can customize your displays. Not quite as cool as what uh, Chancellor Benham will talk about uh, in a moment. Um, one of the interesting trends we're watching is the course taking patterns post pandemic uh, for our students. Uh, and in particular, the modalities that they're selecting in person, online, and hybrid courses. And, and while the details are different on every campus, um, and it's not as predictable as you might think, the shapes in general of the curves going back to pre pandemic to now uh, are all very similar. And they're very consistent with national studies uh, as well as what's going on across the country. Um, so I'll just highlight maybe three key points. Um, we have far fewer fully online students than during the pandemic. Okay, so students are coming back, um, giving, given the opportunity, uh, students are enrolling in courses that are either all in person or partly in person. Um, in addition, we also have far more fully online students than before the pandemic. And again, not surprising, students have gotten a taste of it. Many of them really enjoy it and are successful of them. In some cases, they are fully online for their whole enrollment. In some cases, they're just taking more fully online courses than before the pandemic. Um, as of fall, and we don't have these this one parsed yet for spring, just over 53% of our students across the system were fully online. That's a pretty remarkable number. 26% um, had at least one, but not all fully online courses. And only 20% had absolutely no online courses at all. Um, so this is changing. We have to watch these curves pretty much year to year. Um, we don't know where things will settle down. I'd say from anything I can tell talking with colleagues, nobody in the country knows exactly where things will settle down. Um, to paraphrase Dorothy, um, we aren't in 2019 anymore. Uh, update on extramural funding. Um, this is this morning's number. Um, we're at $331,545,500. We're up just over uh, 4%. I won't say much more because um, at our next uh, committee meeting day, which is just a few weeks, um, Vice President Sirmos will give you a comprehensive update. Um, I, I wanna just say a little bit um, about the new um, uh, federal budget bill that was passed. Um, we have done publicity and our congressional delegation has done publicity about both our earmarks 
and appropriations for UH specific programs. So just in the interest of time, I won't repeat that. It was a great year for us. And if any of you didn't see the press releases that we put out, um, just let us know and, and we'll resend those. Um, I, I wanna highlight just one earmark and then um, something about the, the bills in general uh, that will likely um, help us. Um, the earmark I wanna mention is because of where you are today and your visit to the Creative Media Building later. Um, and this is a system-wide initiative under the leadership of um, Kamu Inos, who you met uh, at a, a previous RNI committee meeting. Uh, he works out of the Office of Vice President of Research and Innovation and heads our Office of Indigenous Innovation. Uh, we had a million dollars in earmark funding to help UH build an indigenous data science hub. Um, and the goal there under Kamu's leadership is to develop sustainability solutions rooted in ancestral knowledge and indigenous practices. And the goal is to strengthen uh, knowledge preservation using data visualization and technology-driven research, focusing on energy security, food security, and place-based learning. And um, if you hang around with Kamu, as he often notes, um, indigenous practice is data science. And um, the way he describes it, the whole ability of the pre-contact Hawaiians to thrive sustainably in these islands required them to read data points in their living environment and then calibrate their everyday practices to align with the caring capacity of the ecosystems in which uh, they lived throughout the seasons and throughout years. Um, some of the work in bringing the technology in will be done here on this campus in the space known as Create X. So when you get over there, you'll see the Create X space. You can't really miss it. It doesn't look like anything else in the building. Um, so it's a great example of a system-wide initiative touching multiple campuses uh, with the support of our congressional delegation. Um, the things I wanted to highlight about the bill itself that we didn't really talk about in the press releases that were focused on local impact, um, one is an increase in the maximum annual Pell Award. Uh, it's now up to uh, $7,395, uh, $7,395. That's a $500 increase. It begins uh, next academic year, 2023-24. Last year, there was a $400 increase. So that's a $900 increase. It's the largest two-year increase in the program's history. And this, these are federal dollars that are grants, not loans, that go to the neediest students. So it's not up to the full cost of tuition at UH Manoa, but we are, a Pell Grant can now cover co the cost of tuition at our uh, other campuses as well. So that's great for students. Um, there were also increases in programs when we report to you on uh, many of our awards that help um, uh, student achievement. There were increases to the programs for Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian education, the program for Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islanders serving institutions, uh, and a PC, so-called. Uh, there were increase in funding for the TRIO program. Uh, these are programs on our campuses that help students who need a little extra help. And then for the Gear Up program, which is a program active um, throughout the state, UH West Oahu participates as well uh, to help bring high school students who would normally not go to college. So not earmarks for UH, but these are programs that typically run tens of millions of dollars a year across the system. So any increase in funding at the federal level helps us compete better for um, increases in funding to help students who here who need help the most. Um, next, let me make a comment about, um, update you on the SCR 201 uh, process. In November in Hilo, we shared with you the report uh, out of the steering committee uh, that was composed of the UH administration and um, uh, UPA working uh, with faculty on the hardest part of this. Uh, since then, we've convened groups of the um, uh, Vice Chancellors for Academic Affairs who are um, most active in working through issues with faculty, uh, hiring, tenure, and promotion. Uh, the Initial policy revisions have now been reviewed by the Office of General Counsel. Um, it's pretty clear that we're gonna need to ascertain the procedures 
uh, that uh, separate formal consultation, that is asking people for their opinions, and where we have um, potential, I would say, likely bargainable aspects where we have to engage in formal collective bargaining with UPA, uh, and that we might work our way through with a, a memorandum of agreement, which is our typical way of making a change in our collective bargaining agreements in between uh, formal new contracts. And then we normally would try to roll them into the next full contract. Uh, in particular, the issue of how we provide employment security outside of tenure, uh, that's an area that um, will likely have to be addressed through collective bargaining. So uh, where we are now, we have three draft uh, amendments to Regents policies. Um, I won't give you the names, but you know we have them. We have three draft rewrites to executive policies, and then we have the matter of where collective bargaining uh, may come into play. So it's basically those six actions that will implement the recommendations that we provided to you uh, in November that we're proceeding with. So we're still on track um, to try and get this work completed this spring. That was our target. Um, and so um, we'll see how it goes, and then we'll have to move into the implementation phase. Finally, just a couple of other tidbits. Um, I stopped reporting regularly on COVID. Um, unfortunately, COVID has not stopped reporting regularly into <laughs> our community or UH. So just um, a reminder for all of you, and also we are now reminding our students, um, get vaccinated. Uh, we have a free vaccination uh, program at UH Manoa where we have a critical mass of people on campus and it makes it worth it. Next week we'll doing, be doing another round of free vaccinations. Um, get your flu vaccination as well while you're at it. Um, but we are not being impacted by COVID um, in a significant way on our campuses at this point uh, other than trying to bring students back from what they have experienced over these past few years. Um, so right now, the most common question I get asked walking around town is who will be the next athletic director uh, that has replaced what's up with the stadium. Um, and, um, I'll just say within minutes of athletic director, UH Manoa athletic director Matlin announcing his retirement plans, um, literally minutes, I had uh, email from and texts from headhunters ready to help us find a new athletic director. I think I got about somewhere between five and 10 inquiries. Um, I was also asked about this in our Senate budget hearing last week. And of course the media have already reported on people with local ties they believe will be candidates. And I'm always interested to read that speculation. I don't know if any of them know they were about to be named as candidates or not. Um, so I wanted to give you an update. Um, fortunately, and A.D. Matlin and I had talked about this last year, as you can imagine, it was not a surprise to me on the day we made the announcement. Um, it was pretty uh, carefully orchestrated. Um, he did give five months notice, which I requested ample lead time. Um, I wanted to let some of the frenzy die down before starting to talk about the um, search and transition. Um, it verifies uh, Vice Chair Nahalea's point late last year that UH Manoa athletics uh, just permeate this community uh, on every island. It It just... You know, if as many people cared about who we hire as a med school dean as care about uh, who our next athletic director would be, this would be an amazing place. Um, not that we aren't an amazing place. So um, procedurally, the UH Manoa athletic director reports directly to the president. Therefore, under board policy, you will be brought a recommendation from me to approve the appointment of the next athletic director under our two level rule. Um, I do plan to bring you a recommendation before he departs. Um, at this time, given the level of interest in the position, I do not believe that uh, we need a search firm to help us conduct a successful search. Um, so at this point, I'm expecting to convene a search advisory committee that has both internal UH 
and community members. I will ask them to screen candidates and provide me with a list of qualified candidates with their assessment of strengths and weaknesses. At that point, I will interview them and um, uh, make a selection as to who to recommend to you for uh, approval of an appointment. This is the process that we used eight years ago. Uh, I think it worked well. It resulted in the selection of a, um, a, just a superb athletic director, David Matlin, um, who managed to survive eight years in uh, one of the hardest jobs in this university. At that time, it was interim chancellor Robert Bly Broman who made the appointment. Um, and, and just to forestall any questions, um, the committee has not been selected or appointed. I have not made any calls to anyone to request them to be on it. And we will publicly announce the membership when that is done. And I will warn them that they can expect to be lobbied by their friends and colleagues in the community because that is how it works here. Um, my last item, since we're in athletic land, let me just highlight um, how wonderful it is that our esports program at UH Manoa was named the best collegiate esports program in the country uh, last year by Esports Awards. Um, we had been a finalist the previous year. There's only 10 finalists. So it was really nice to be named a finalist again and then win out of the 10 finalists. And this is um, one of those contests that's selected by a panel of experts provides 75% of the input, and there's a popular vote that provides 25% of the input. Um, you will also get to see the UH West Oahu eSports facility when you tour the Creative Media Building. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, Chris Lee. Uh, Chris is in the back, uh, um, who's the uh, director and founder of the system-wide Academy of Creative Media. He'll be around during the tour, but um, he has um, taken a very broad definition of creative media, inclusive of esports, and he's been really supportive of the program at both Manoa and here. And I'll just say that our director at Manoa, um, Sky Kavaloa, um, who finished his PhD with a dissertation on esports and academia, uh, he's now a full-time employee. He is driving our program, not just at Manoa, but system-wide and statewide. He was also involved in the uh, esports program at the library in Waipahu as well. So we're really um, making an impact in this area across the university and across the state. 